Hello. Um, it's a real joy for me uh, to be with, here with you today. Um, like Brent said, I was once a BYU student. My split. I was once a BYU student myself, wondering where my interest in American history and in the history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints would lead me. I remember hearing about internships with the Joseph Smith Papers in some of my classes, but did not have the time or freedom in my schedule to pursue it. I could never have imagined that I would be hired to work for the Joseph Smith Papers as a historian and documentary documentary editor, and that 10 years later, I would be standing here speaking. I am grateful for the opportunity I have had to work in this field. Not only have I found it to be highly rewarding, but it has also made me a better scholar and historian. Documentary editing has brought me closer to primary sources than anything I had done in my studies or career thus far. The importance of this work cannot be overstated because primary sources are the bedrock of many kinds of historical analysis. While historians must continue to be more inclusive in their search to understand the past without written sources, much of what we know about certain aspects of history will be heavily informed by the written record. But first, what is documentary editing? I honestly did not know a lot about it myself before I started working on the Joseph Smith Papers. In the broadest terms, it is tracking down selected primary sources and publishing transcripts of the sources online or in a printed volume. These final products ha often have contextual footnotes and other supplementary materials, such as maps, charts, and short bios of people mentioned in the papers and more. The aim of such an endeavor is to make these primary sources more accessible and available to researchers in an accurate form, along with resources to help scholars better understand the contents. There are a lot of decisions to make when choosing how to represent historical texts, many more than I would have thought before working on the project. That's where careful and thoughtful editing comes in, which I will get to shortly. Um, this aspect of gathering and publishing sources is not that new, all things considered. In the founding era, a man named Ebenezer Hazard began, excuse me, became the first person to receive a government grant for research when he proposed gathering, quote, a collection of American state papers to furnish materials for a good history of the United States. The Continental Congress agreed that it was a cause worth funding and was, quote, productive to public utility. Between 1779 and 1780, he traveled to Boston and Plymouth to capture records of the New England Confederation and later copied many records housed in Pennsylvania and New Hampshire and throughout the former colonies. Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson told Hazard, quote, I learn with great satisfaction that you are committing to the press the valuable historical and state papers you have been so long collecting. Time and accident are committing daily havoc on the originals deposited in our public offices. The late war has done the work of centuries in this business. The loss cannot be recovered, but let us save what remains, not by vaults and locks which fence them from public eye and use, in consigning them to the waste of time, but by such a multiplication of copies as shall place them beyond the reach of accident. So Thomas Jefferson was a fan of documentary editing. <laughs> The fruits of Hazard's labors became historical collections consisting of state papers and other authentic documents intended as materials for an history of the United States of America. They used to have long titles back then. I don't want to belabor you with all the details of how docu documentary editing came to be, but this origin story shows the value that we have placed on record preservation and that certain texts were deemed worthy of reproduction and wide distribution for historical analysis. But it also shows how this field has favored certain kinds of records, certain areas of history, and certain figures from the very beginning. Figures such as Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, and the Adams family have received the lion's share of resources and attention, but they have also been projects that have developed this field in significant ways. Another important point about these edited collection of statesman papers is that they influenced the initial creation of the Joseph Smith papers. Latter-day Saint historians in the second half of the 20th century looked at the work being done to gather and publish the records of Thomas Jefferson and others and thought, something like this should be done for the papers of Joseph Smith. Dean Jesse, a Latter-day Saint historian who worked in the church's historical department under Letter and Arrington, did a lot of preliminary work on this and produced three volumes in the late 1980s and early 1990s. But when the Joseph Smith Papers began officially in 2001, the project leaders earnestly collaborated with other documentary editing projects to learn more about the trade. JSP historians also joined the Association for Documentary Editing. That's right, it has its own organization. The JSP has been shaped by the highest standards of professional documentary editing. And for this, the project has earned the respect and credibility in and outside of the church and within the academic community. 
And now for some of the particulars about this documentary editing process. Earlier this year, the JSP released Documents Volume 14, which is my primary assignment when I started working on the project in 2018. I want to use this volume to illustrate how we approached editing the documents that were created in our assigned timeline, which was January 1st, 1844 to May 15th, 1844. The word editing makes it sound like we are altering the text, but rather editing makes, means making choices about which text to represent and how. Many of the documents in the volume are correspondence items, letters to or from Joseph Smith. There are many more Joseph Smith documents than we have the resources and ability to print, but the JSP editors decided to include um, the entire corpus of his correspondence in our print volumes. The digital images of these documents are available on the church's, hist uh, excuse me, church's library catalog under the call number MS-155 in the Joseph Smith collection. In late 1843, Joseph Smith sent letters to leading presidential candidates for the upcoming election. He received a letter back from Senator John C. Calhoun in early January 1844 and wrote a response that was published in the Times and Seasons, the church's newspaper in Nauvoo. There are no extant drafts of the letter, nor is the copy sent to and presumably received by Calhoun. And so there is no letter to Calhoun and Joseph Smith's correspondence folder from this time period. If you were looking for all of the letters Joseph Smith sent, you would not find them in one location, even when copies were made of letters before sending them. But in our volume, you can look at these letters and when they were written in chronological order. This is incredibly helpful for researchers. And I'll give you a few more examples of that from our volume. This letter, dated 8th of January, 1844, was written by a nan man named Thomas Foster who was living in New York City. Foster, who identified himself as a physician, wrote Joseph Smith to ask, quote, how the good cause of Mormonism is flourishing in the West. Excuse my presumption in writing so familiarly to a great man, he wrote. Be kind enough to let me know all the particulars about Nauvoo. I have some idea of settling there for the purpose of practicing medicine. If you think I can do well, please inform me as soon as possible. That's quite a request, right? This letter does not have an extant response, meaning we don't know if Joseph Smith ever replied to Foster. And there is no record of Foster moving to Nauvoo. Documentary editors do extensive research into the physical creation of the text, how it was transmitted if delivered, and its chain of custody, or what is called provenance. This letter ended up in the possession of Bishop Newell K. Whitney after Joseph Smith's death, along with other financial and administrative records. One of Whitney's daughters, um, Mary Jane Whitney, married Isaac Grew, and the letter was retained within the succeeding generations until the Grew family donated their papers to BYU between 1969 and 1974. And so to view this letter today, you'd have to go to the special collections here at BYU. With permission from BYU, the letter was photographed and is now accessible on our website, and that's where these images come from. That it is included in our volume shows how document editing brings documents together virtually on the web and physically with text, tra text transcripts that do not actually coexist in the same physical space. When documents are start e stored even further apart than Salt Lake City and Provo, this becomes an even bigger convenience for researchers. Instead of having to navigate two archives or two websites, the document can be found in one central publication or one central website. Another figure, another genre that figures prominently in documents, documents volume 14 is discourses or sermons given by Joseph Smith. Bringing together all contemporary accounts of Joseph Smith's discourses is one of the most significant products of this documentary editing projects, project. One of the discourses in this volume was recorded by Wilfred Woodruff in his personal journal. And it is the only account of that particular, that particular discourse that is known. Woodruff's handwriting suggests that it is a fair copy, which means that it was not written while Joseph Smith was actively speaking, or it would have appeared rushed and have included some mistakes. And you can see by looking at it that that looks pretty neat. Um, Joseph Smith, edit, uh, JSP editors could not determine whether Woodruff recorded this discourse from his notes or just from memory, but it offers in insight into how Joseph Smith taught about the spirit of Elijah and the importance of temples in redeeming the dead. He explained that in order to gain exaltation in the highest kingdom, one must abide what he called celestial law. But he found that it had been hard to, quote, get anything into the heads of this generation. It has been like splitting headlock, excuse me, hemlock knots with a corn dodger for a wedge and a pumpkin for a beetle. This comparison about the difficulty of trying to accomplish a task without having the right tools yields a new perspective on teaching methods used by Joseph Smith at this time in his life. 
We have this text thanks to Wilford Woodruff who managed to write it down in his personal journal. Woodruff was a source for many of the texts of Joseph Smith's discourses in those later Nauvoo, Nauvoo years, but there were others as well. Where there are multiple contemporary uh, accounts of a discourse, we have included the transcripts of each one under one historical introduction heading for all of them. One example of this is the discourse given on 7 March 1844. There are three accounts included, one kept by Richards, uh, Willard Richards, that is, one by Wilford Woodruff, and one by a man named Charles A. Foster, who was actually an antagonist and published his account of the discourse in the Warsaw Signal, a newspaper which was quite hostile to Joseph Smith and the Saints in print. In print. All three of these discourses exist in se uh, separate physical spaces. The one kept by Richards was inscribed in Joseph Smith's journal, the one by Woodruff in his personal journal, and the one by Foster in printed copies of the Warsaw Signal. This volume also contains another multiple account discourse commonly referred to as the King Follett Address. This is one of the most significant contributions from our volume in terms of making primary sources available in one place with careful editing. In total, there are seven accounts of that discourse, including accounts kept in journals of men named George, excuse me, George Lobb and Samuel W. Richards, who succinctly captured a compelling theme of the discourse, um, which he recorded as, uh, to know God, learn to become gods. Documentary, excuse me, um, documentary editors spend a lot of time with primary sources, creating methods for representing this historic fact, artifacts accurately. Indeed, every letter, punctuation mark, and character that appears in these volumes has been verified three times, including by a historian who examined the original document and compared it with the transcript to make sure they were congruent to the best of their ability. Elder Bednar recently stated that these efforts, quote, will only make us more effective in telling the story of the ongoing restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that the work is just beginning, that the utility of the Joseph Smith papers, quote, has not even been, even in the smallest measure, fully realized, close quote. As documentary editors, we hope that having reliable primary sources with helpful supplemental resources will aid our fellow saints and academics alike in their pursuit to better understand the profit of the restoration. Thank you.